Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, for coming and for engaging in discussions uh, with us on this important set of reforms. And I congratulate you on it. Uh, it looks really great, as well as uh, members of the committee who work really hard uh, uh, to bring about this uh, proposal. Uh, I've told myself once I get a chance to sit down with President Kagame, there's one question mm. that I really want to ask, and it's a broader question about reform more broadly. Uh, it's usually the uh, often prescribed uh, policy, uh, reform, 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 but it doesn't seem to be an easy process. Uh, but you have a pretty good track record uh, with reform, and I suspect that's why you were asked by uh, your peers to lead this process. So what is President Kagame's secret recipe, if there's such a thing, or the Kagame doctrine when it comes to reforms more broadly? And how has that helped with the current reform process? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say there is uh, anything so special uh, about Kagame or Rwanda, but I'll just say given our own history, which has been very challenging, mm -hmm. looking at where we have been, meaning Rwanda and the long journey we have traveled to this day and the changes that have taken place and progress made. Uh, I think we have benefited from uh, these immense challenges, because we have had to stand up and confront and you know deal with them in a straightforward mm -hmm. manner, uh, because we did not think that um, sitting back and doing nothing or expecting other people to come and do things for us yeah. would take us anywhere. Anyway, again, we, we've learned these lessons ourselves directly. So I'm not talking about stories of other places I have heard about or read. And so and it just comes to uh, making a decision and the choices mm -hmm. as to how you, whether you confront these challenges and improve uh, your own situation and the lives of people involved which was the case for Rwanda. We are challenged by many things, as you know. It's the history, the politics, the genocide, you know, loss of a million lives in just 100 days. And, but even originally, even before that, we were just a poor country uh, and badly governed and as may mirror what has happened in some other parts of our continent. So for us to have these, you know, if you will, two things. One, that others were not experiencing, and that's the, the tragedy of genocide. The other, which was generally shared about poverty, about bad politics, and, and so on. So to come out of this, uh, the, the, there is no miracle. It's, it's, it's just doing what is doable by human beings. I think it's, it's what is humanly possible. We did to simply, and we are decided, we are determined, we are focused on making sure that, no, this can't be what we deserve in the first place. This uh, can be changed and beginning with ourselves, even if we are to be able to get assistance from other places. So the, the and that thinking was generally shared mm -hmm. by the people of Rwanda. And I think catalyzed really by the kind of suffering Rwandans have gone through. Mm -hmm. I think it, it hardened the people, it made them you know, more determined uh, and decided on making these hard choices and doing even the hard work to get out of that situation and move on. So, we were able to galvanize uh, the efforts of everyone, and based on this thinking, we, we found we are making progress, even in a, in a situation with limited resources. But at least the will and the determination were not limited. 
Okay. We, we, okay. Had, we were falling short on means and a few other things, but mm -hmm. we weren't falling short on determination okay. and okay. Uh, and dedication to do our part. Okay. So then that has created the basis to, at least that experience was leveraged in terms of thinking about how to approach uh, the EU yes, yes. reforms. Okay. In fact, that's how maybe Africans, having seen other Africans, having seen where Rwanda has been, where we have come from, and where we are, and the progress made, I, I, they must have taken notice that, you know, it had to take certain maybe qualities or efforts or determination to actually bring about the change. And, yeah. and I think based on that, other than constantly sharing what has been happening in our country and what we have done to overcome these difficulties, yeah. They must have said maybe there is something here with the people of Rwanda that can help carry out right. these other reforms mm -hmm. that we need across. Because again, there are similarities. There are more similarities than differences yes. across the continent. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing led to another and influenced another. Then uh, I think that's how they came to select. Uh, uh, Rwanda and myself mm -hmm. to champion this, mm -hmm. uh, but working with other Africans mm -hmm. that had been uh, uh, identified mm -hmm. to be part of the team, uh, each one to bring their own uh, expertise and, uh, 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 and experiences to, to try and work with other Africans to cut out the overall or the broad reform across mm -hmm. the continent. Yeah, okay. So then the uh, EU, an institution like the EU is uh, obviously kind, kind of complex in terms of ability to reform it. And it's just not the EU, I think, to a large organization like European Union or to even see meaningful reform for the United Nations. You have to go back several decades, I think, to the sort of the 60s. So even with uh, your experience, you must have encountered uh, some kind of uh, obstacles. Uh, and I think in your remarks in, uh, in July, you alluded to uh, where there are some hesitations uh, that should not uh, uh, discourage us and that they could likely reflect misunderstandings or miscommunications and that as a family, those can be addressed. Uh, we're now in a position where we think such concerns have been addressed or that they don't pose any significant uh, threat to the reform process. The concerns will be addressed along the way. Mm -hmm. In fact, maybe when you deal with some concerns, others merge, or even when uh, you have you know, brought in everybody and they have supported and even made the uh, claim to, to be supportive, maybe along the way again something else crops up, mm -hmm. either by influence yeah. uh, from wherever to, and we really create a doubt yeah. in people who initially were not doubtful. But this is expected. I think that's where uh, we started from. The moment you expect these challenges, so when they come up, they don't surprise you. Right. Maybe yeah. you also plan either ahead or, you know, as they come up, how to deal with them. Mm. Uh, and, and it, it's always going to be a life of challenges. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, we face much bigger and more challenges by not doing what we are trying to do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the, the, the challenges posed by trying to carry out reform are expected. Nonetheless, I think they can be dealt with. But you know, once you make a step in that regard, uh, everyone actually benefits mm -hmm. immensely. So we, we, there is an incentive, if you will, mm -hmm. for people to really try everything that mm -hmm. is possible to do that. But you always find doubts. You always find excuses. You always, uh, as happens with the changes in many regards for, for you know, for many things, yeah. changes. <laughs> are a problem unto themselves, and, and you, you, you just uh, need to remain, uh, to remain focused on the prize, the, the real thing you want to get at. Mm -hmm. but, but for, for challenges, 
those are guaranteed. Okay. So we're quite optimistic at this stage that the process is Very optimistic on track. Very optimistic because we have seen across the continent the desire to see these reforms work. I think there are more countries, more people uh, who have the desire to see us make improvement. Okay. I mean, everybody wants this kind of progress. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with the, the few challenges, but I think with the growing numbers of, of countries and people mm -hmm. who are interested in making this work, mm -hmm. I have no doubt uh, about the end result being what we want. Okay, very good. So in your remarks, you, you, you stress a couple of elements. One was uh, the financing, uh, and the other was the need for Africa to speak with uh, one voice, and I think these are uh, key elements of the, of the reform. Um, the financing decision, actually, you mentioned started earlier. Um, and I wonder if there's been sufficient time now to be able to see whether uh, African states are uh, eagerly uh, contributing, uh, the share they should be uh, contributing to the financing of the EU. And the other processes too where one may be looking to gauge if there's sufficient progress could be the upcoming summits, one in Abidjan of uh, EU-Africa partnership and then following month in Buenos Aires, uh, World uh, Trade Organization. Uh, are we getting a sense also that Africa is approaching those meetings within the framework and spirit of the, the reforms? Again, it, it's a question of process. Mm -hmm. But to begin with, I think there was consensus that there is a need for reform. There was a need for uh, self-financing uh, for the AU. So that principle is very important that mm -hmm. it generated a consensus across the continent. Mm -hmm. The problem will always be uh, in the area of implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, people not doing exactly what they have committed themselves to or doing half of that, or, you know, going slowly and so on. But, for example, we have now... 12 countries mm -hmm. who have actually started using this formula in just a matter of months alone. Mm -hmm. uh, even with the difficulties the countries were uh, expressing mm -hmm. of uh, 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 you know, going along that proposal that was made mm -hmm. because of you know, legal, constitutional, and other matters in, in their own countries. Mm -hmm. But because the, the many of them were determined again, mm -hmm. they went back home and cleared the hurdles that were there mm -hmm. so that progress will be made. You could, you could see 11, 12 countries, you know, taking up that and mm -hmm. doing it. So first, I think, is, is a very good sign. Mm -hmm. And the others were said to be... Uh, doing what needs to be done, and they were talking about also speeding it up so that it, it starts working. But here we are not dealing with a new problem. The, it's a very old problem. In fact, that's indeed what probably also is associated with the, the complexity. The problem of Africa not being independent yeah. Is uh, you know has a very long history, as, mm -hmm. as you know. Or and, and of course related to that lack of uh, one voice representing Africa. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of uh, challenges to overcome. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, in any case, take away the need mm -hmm. for us to really tackle this problem. Because when we in Africa uh, speak with one voice, when we need to be independent, because as we know, it's simple, and I just mentioned it. If someone is paying, you know, it's very interesting because uh, as I said, having 97% of some, mm -hmm. some areas of our activities being 
paid from outside. One, even when we said, no, we need to start paying mm -hmm. for ourselves, you know, those ones who were actually paying started <laughs> complaining. It's yeah. like the outsiders are interested yeah. in paying our bills for everything yeah. than see us be, take responsibility. I mean, in between <laughs> that, what do you notice? I, I think you find uh, there's something very strange about it. Yeah. If somebody is paying my bills and I say, no, you know what, let me take a share of it or let me pay, and say, no, 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 don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> I think it is a cause for a lot of suspicion. <laughs> And why wouldn't Africans be suspicious? <laughs> this is another thing. Yeah. I have, I, we may have a problem with Africans who don't find this suspicious. It means there's yeah. something wrong, therefore we need to correct yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's an old problem, but I think Africans across uh, the whole continent, especially the young ones, mm -hmm. Yeah, even the old ones, uh, I think, <laughs> are beginning to say, I think there is a need to, <laughs> to change this old bad habit. Of, yeah, yeah. Of, uh, yeah and, and I think what is happening on the ground also, um, our situations in our countries, uh, even for those who are insensitive, I think some things start happening that... Yeah they wake up to this reality that uh, we, we need. We need to change, and it is good for us. By the way, it is also good for our partners. Yeah. I think yeah. our partners need to uh, be working with uh, uh, Africa that mm -hmm. wants to raise its stake in, yeah. in world affairs and stand up for, for ourselves and yeah. you, you, you have a better partner mm -hmm. who, who brings something right. rather than the one who keeps asking for <laughs> you to, to give charity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in terms of our partnership, obviously one big issue is the, the migration, right? as you mentioned, if we're Africa, is, prosperous Africa is good for, uh, for everybody. And whenever we see stories about young people risking their lives to reach the shores of Europe, it's, in, again, a stark reminder of uh, how we need to be uh, doing a bit more, uh, taking our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the AU context, they've outlined uh, like a, a, an agenda 2063, uh, which has some really uh, important aspirations, and really ambitious. Uh, I wanted to use this change before I turn on to the audience for open discussion as to um, how likely is it, or how would a reform AU, or, or let's put it this way, if the reform of the AU do not succeed for whatever reason, and we are already ruining for it to succeed, what is the likelihood of being able to fulfill those aspirations on the Agenda 2063? Well, I think the, the two are very closely related mm -hmm. uh, for the ambitions the goals of 2063, uh, there is a pathway. There is a certain direction you have to take to, to get there. Yeah. Uh, and part of that is making the reform work. Mm -hmm. They are really tied in together. Uh, uh, so unless 2063 become, continues to just become wishful thinking, right. but we have to create these pathways that mm -hmm. will lead us there, mm -hmm. and one of them is to be able to do these things mostly ourselves, mm -hmm. be able to finance our activities, because we can. You, you see, mm -hmm. it's really pathetic. Most of these countries in Africa, mm -hmm. I mean, we can't keep having Africa that is... Uh, uh, you know, so wealthy in mm -hmm. terms of all kinds of resources. Mm -hmm. 
but at the same time, we have poor Africans. Yeah, that's a paradox. Yeah. We really need, we have to bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. and, and one way is through these reforms, is through implementation, follow up on doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and there is no lack of knowledge as to what we need to do. Largely, all Africans, the leaders, the citizens, mm -hmm. Whatever you talk about, they are already, the majority are aware of what needs to be done. Mm. It's just, you know, pushing that button to make sure that uh, yeah, everybody, other than the thinking, mm. the actions also really accompany that and, and we, we, so that we change things. Um, I think we will get there, and the two are tied. It's the reform okay. process, it's the 2063 agenda, it's the mindset change that we have to even look back and say, why are we here? Yeah. Where others have been but have left us and have gone so far ahead. Mm -hmm. What is it? What's wrong with Africa? We need to answer this question. Yeah, it's not a curse. Mm -hmm. It's just that, <laughs> yeah, it can't be because most of these advanced economies, unfortunately, actually are contributed to by Africans. <laughs> a lot of them. Mm -hmm. If these Africans could really start doing some of the things uh, they know they could help with within our continent, and if for our political systems could allow that to happen. And of course, when I say that, I, I, I'm talking about leaders at different levels who really have uh, authority, power, or responsibility in their hands. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we need to change things, otherwise they just won't change mm -hmm. without us doing what we need yeah. to do. Yeah. Okay, so with this, I'll, uh, I'll turn over to the uh, to the audience, we'll open it up for questions. I'm sure you've been eagerly waiting to get into the, the discussion. Yes, Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much, Cody. And if you would, uh, please, uh, as you come to ask questions, state your name and uh, your affiliation. That would be great. Thank you. I'm Liberata Mlamula. They call me Ambassador. I'm now with the George Washington University. Mr. President Karibusana. Asante. I'm now on the other side. Which side? <laughs> <laughs> so I can be feel free to come to pose a question. Um, Mr. President, um, this week we have had uh, round tables. There is, um, I'm sure you are familiar with this, uh, Constituents for Africa. We had the round tables at the African Union at the George Washington University. One of the round tables was about empowering the next, the next generation of leaders. And this was the most challenging round table because we had the, the youth, the students, putting us to task. And this, of course, also was in the framework of the African Union. They said, we hear about these reforms. We hear about uh, all these initiatives. But then we don't see the youth, the young people at the table. And whether they, when they are at the table, they are not engaged in the conversation. So I'm posting this to you because I'm also teaching about gender and leadership in Africa. And the question every time that comes around is um, Africa Union, in terms of the leadership, is there a club, a man club, a men club? But also for things like the reforms, he said you are just speaking among yourselves. You need to have a new trajectory. You need to have to bring this youth, these young minds, that they use technology. For example, when you talk of uh, 0.2%, how you do it, I don't know, but then they say, we can also bring the tools to see how best you can have this implemented. 
So the question I'm putting to you, which you should help me to be able to come back to this, to this youth and the young <laughs> leaders, on wh what, is, um, what is the inspiration, what is the hope for them to get to engage the African leaders? So this is my question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but I think it is not uh, entirely true that the young people are, are not engaged. Because I've been to places where the young people have been engaged. Uh, well, in some cases, maybe they are not where they really are, should be expected to be, but that doesn't go for every case. But I think the point being made is clear. Uh, the point you are making is, in all these processes, we should involve everybody, and particularly the young people. I think that's the point that has been made for a long time, uh, wherever you go. So I, I, I don't disagree with that, not at all. I think, one, everybody who has what to contribute should be engaged. Two, the young people especially have a lot to offer. And they should therefore be brought in uh, as a way not only of communicating to them what there is, but also making them, you know, uh, get involved uh, and probably taking some of the responsibilities they should. Having said that, uh, I think we will also need, we will need to correct, and maybe this can this can be corrected by the way we communicate. We need to, first of all, involve the youth. Those who have responsibility at different levels need to think about that. And, and really, because there is a lot we can tap you know, f f from them. But I think the youth, the youth should, the young people should feel they have that responsibility to show up. They need to be there. They need to show up. They, they can't be there and say, no, no, they didn't call me. So, <laughs> you know, the responsibility should be shared, really. Yes, the young people, should, they are important. But you see, when you are important and say, okay, I'm important, but so somebody should recognize that and, and come to me, then there is a problem. The young people are important. We, they are needed. They should show up, they should come forward, and even in demand. And actually say, no, we want to be part of this. It's their right to demand. Uh, so, I, again, it's a long journey. It's not, it's, it won't happen overnight. It won't happen just because somebody remembers to do that and another one doesn't, and then the young people so sometimes they are there, another time they are not there. We need all to move, to get things moving and come forward and, and, and do some of these things. Uh, but uh, the point is taken. The young people tell them, I completely agree with you. <laughs> they should be involved. <laughs> uh, but they should really show up. Yeah. And actually, <laughs> to underscore that point, one of yeah. the key proposals in the uniform, I believe, is actually to set up quotas for young uh, people and Yes. Win and women. Women, yes. yeah. I think the gentleman in the third row with the glasses is next. Um, I'm Mr. President. My name is Anesu. I'm from Zimbabwe, and I'm a young person, and I'm... I'm going to show up. <laughs> I'm showing up. Exactly. That's a good example. In fact, I'm going to set a proposal that whatever uh, committee is going to be formed for young people, I'm inviting myself to that committee. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, my question really is to, I'm a master's student uh, for international development here in Washington, D.C. at uh, the School for International Training. Um, my question really is about to do with the financing. Um, I hear the African Union is really focusing on how we should finance ourselves. Um, but as I look at it, um, most African countries don't or don't have that capacity to finance themselves, let alone the African Union. So it, it, I'll give an example of, for example, if I am a business person in Zimbabwe and I have a product, I will choose to go and sell that product in Europe because I'll get more money than 
going at that product maybe in Zambia because they probably won't pay me as much as I have. So should we be focusing more on how to really build our economies, to be functional economies and really have those currencies that we need so that we have enough capacity to fund not just the African Union but our own countries? What, what focus is happening towards that direction? That's my question. But it is not either or. When, when, when you are talking about uh, being able to finance our activities, we, we weren't talking about stopping countries growing their economies uh, at all. We are saying they should happen at the same time. But it, it is also not true. If you look at every country uh, across the continent, actually, what is asked of them to pay the share of burden for the AU is something they can afford. And, and it's not a flat kind of contribution. Those who have more contribute more than others. Those who have less will contribute less. I think that was taken care of. It's, it's not a big thing. But there is um, a problem here that maybe we, we may be missing. Even things as they stand today, before this formula was given, and initially people, countries were not even complaining that they are being asked to pay more than they are capable of. That hasn't become an issue. Uh, but of course, what we find is that some countries among those who are actually known to have resources don't even pay. And not paying has, doesn't have a relationship with being capable or not to pay. It, it is just the will to pay or, or the understanding of what that does that should be positive for the continent. So it's a lot of, I, mean, I think there is more politics involved and the will to really say advancing the cause of the continent is advancing your own cause as a country. Right. There is a sort of disconnect. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I think you're next. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Excellency. I'm uh, Ambassador Kanashiombori. I'm your African Union Ambassador to the United States. Mine is a comment. And I just wanted to thank you, first and foremost, for what you have done for the women of Rwanda. And hopefully you will duplicate that in the rest of the continent. For those of you who do not know... Rwanda has a 64% female cabinet. No country in the world comes in a pa Parliament. Parliament, yes, Parliament, yes. 64%. Yeah. And 40 something in the cabinet. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> So for that, we want to thank you. And uh, those are some of the things that we need to highlight as we engage our conversations about Africa. And to my sister, Ambassador, I wanted to say for you, to your students, you need to let your students know that for you, for you to be able to contribute to the development of Africa, first and foremost, you must stand up and be counted. Mm -hmm. We have no idea who you are and where you are. Mm -hmm. The Indian diaspora are organized. Their voices are loud and clear. The Chinese, the Indian, the Irish, the Japanese, you name it. The diaspora from other ethnic groups are very organized. When you ask for the voices of the African diaspora, go to the graveyard, because we are nowhere to be heard. Okay. So before the leadership can stand up and help us, they must know where we are and what we are doing. So tell your young people and you young men from Zimbabwe, stand up and be counted so we can speak for you. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Thank you. I think Please, uh, uh, Dr. The, the African Please. Union is well represented. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Excellency. First, my name is Ngozi Okonjiwal. I'm on the advisory board 
along with Donald Kabaruk of the this African Growth Initiative. So among other things. So I wanted to first say congratulations to Cool and AGI and Brookings uh, for doing this. This is the kind, bringing one of our top leaders to discuss as an issue of great substance. This is where we want to go. But I wanted to push His Excellency a bit. He has done some remarkable reforms in Rwanda that really matter, which is the open borders. Um, anyone African, I understand now, can come in without a visa. You have agreements with several other countries for a joint visa to, to move around. I think every African, if we're really to make progress on, on trade and other economic issues, we want these open borders for people to be able to move around. It's like the one reform that Africans could see and really feel. So I wanted to say, how can you share your experience and the good results you're getting from this policy mm -hmm. and push all of us on the continent to go the same way? Yes. Thank you. Well, I, I, I wish uh, pushing all of you would yield results, and we will try. But the best push comes uh, in the way um, indeed of example. Uh, there are these things we have tried to do I I in our own country. Basically in our own self-interest, meaning uh, the benefits that come from what we are doing uh, are primarily experienced by Rwandans who have done that. But this, I think, may benefit others or, you know, by working as an example of what is possible. In fact, some of the things we have done is like we are telling our brothers and sisters on the continent that if Rwanda can do it, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, for example, on the question of opening our borders, you know, all Africans find a visa at the airport when they are coming to Rwanda. There is no hassle for visas to, to, to Rwanda and, and even some other countries, but specifically for the Africans. And the, the demonstration here was also to tell Africans, because some of them think if they open their borders, you know, everybody will come, you know, wrong people will come and cause problems in these countries. We haven't received the wrong people <laughs> <laughs> causing us problems. So if I tell the rest of our continent and the world that actually by being open, we haven't met any new problems that have come because of that. That's very true. Yes, it would be... But... Um, and that's where our push is in that form. Because there is no way one country can push other countries to do what the country thinks is right or what is even working for them. But if you keep showing this example, if, if the way we have involved the women in the whole you know, structure of our economy and the way it has worked, I mean... 52% of our population are women. And we have involved women as much as they should be. <laughs> because it's not even a, a favor we are doing women. It's, it's really, <laughs> we are doing ourselves a favor, the whole country. Because everybody is, a part, is participating. And then the rights are being also respected of, of everyone. So maybe the harmony in, in, in Rwanda, the stability and the continued growth of our economy can easily be attributed to this approach that everybody is involved and particularly women who have been left behind before and it, like it still exists in other places are actually part of this stability, continued growth and, and so on and so forth. It's a benefit. If anyone who can find sense in that and maybe apply it for a similar situation, I think that's how it works. But constantly, and we have had the beauty of it again, and 
relating it to questions asked earlier. Africans are eager to have things change. That's what is. And we have seen many countries, country delegations, one after another, come to Rwanda to ask us, say, how did you do this? What, how, what, is the, what are the results? What are the obstacles? What? We have many country delegations coming to share. As we have done ourselves, we've gone to, gone to places and to say, how did you do this? Yeah. Yes, and we, we, we go and do it. The difference is always going to be, are you going to do it? <laughs> yes. Or will you give up when it gets hard? <laughs> yeah, that, that's the whole thing, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't give up, if yeah. you really do it, if you keep trying, so it, it will work. So we may just have time for just one more question, and then uh, we'll have His Excellency have the last word before we wrap up. Uh, uh, Monday. Uh, my name is Monde Muyango. I'm the director of the Africa program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I wanted to follow up on this question about financing of the African Union. There are lots of us who are cheering you on and all the, work, the hard work that Rwanda and members of the committee have done to ensure that Africa owns the African Union because without that, the future of that continent is actually quite bleak. My question to you is this. We know that some African countries, including quite a few in the Southern African Development Community, are pushing back on the 0.2% uh, levy. Now, is that a question of the modalities that have been defined for contributing that 2%? Or is it a question of the note of a ball that was sent regarding the WTO, that that is presenting some fear about what the possible economic repercussions might be? Or is it the case that there are some countries, both within Africa and outside, who are afraid of what an efficient and effective AU might mean for the future? I, I think simply and straightforward, the la that last one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very clear. <laughs> Because you, you find even some of those who really initially had no problem, they liked it, they supported it. Then after some weeks, they start saying, no, but you see this. And this. You really ask, you engage, you explain. You, and then you start saying, OK, what is the alternative? And they can't give you the alternative. So I think. You've really answered the, my question, the, the question without... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, which is perhaps why we really need to do this. <laughs> yes. Yes. So unfortunately, that's all the time we had. Uh, uh, really thank you, His Excellency, for joining us and sharing your perspective. Um, certainly here at the uh, Africa Growth Initiative, we'll be following the reforms, uh, the progress, and we hope to be able to welcome you in the future okay. uh, to discuss at that time, hopefully, uh, how the reform already implemented are uh, contributing to prosperity uh, on, the, on the continent. Uh, so if you would, uh, if you don't mind remaining sitting for the next uh, uh, minute or so as uh, His Excellency makes uh, his exit on the building, I appreciate it. And thanks you all for coming. Well, but let me first thank you mm -hmm. and uh, the Brookings Institute for giving us this opportunity and uh, uh, the audience here that uh, uh, was very interesting, and I always be happy to come and uh, uh, share with you matters related to this reform or any other matters as an African, <laughs> a, a, a very proud African. <laughs> Good, thank you.